Hello, my name is Ethan Pauley, and today we will be discussing the life and legacy of William Hull, a governor and military commander in the War of 1812, who is best known for his ill-attempted invasion of Canada and subsequent loss of the settlement of Detroit, leading many historians to state that Hull was an ill-fitted man for the post in the army and should not have been there at all. We'll look into the governorship and military career of Hull, and from this it can be determined how much Hull can be blamed for his failures in the American Northwest. William Hull was born June 24, 1753, in the small settlement of Derby, Connecticut, the son of Joseph Hull and Eliza Clark, who were farmers in the area. At the age of 15, Hull enrolled at Yale College, where he graduated with honors in 1772. Upon the request of his parents, Hull began to study divinity at Yale with the intention of becoming a minister. This, however, was abandoned after a year, and instead he chose to devote himself to law, and was admitted to the bar in 1775. Shortly after this, the Revolutionary War broke out, and Hull volunteered at a recruiting location in Derby. After participating in what would be the Siege of Boston, Hull and his company would join up with the army at Fort Washington. It was here, according to his memoirs, that he tried to dissuade his friend and classmate at Yale, Nathan Hale, from entering into the British Army as a spy. It was because of Hull that we know of Nathan Hale's famous last words, I only regret that I have one life to lose for my country. By the end of the war, Hull had risen to the rank of lieutenant colonel and had gained a reputation as being a reliable and competent officer in the army, especially after a daring raid he conducted on a British outpost at Morsania in January of 1781. He left the service in June of 1784 and would take up the practice of law in Newton, Massachusetts while caring for his wife and his eight children. In 1787, he would briefly return to service under the United States Peacetime Army in order to suppress Shay's Rebellion. In 1793, he went on a diplomatic mission to Canada in an unsuccessful attempt to gain British cooperation in negotiating a treaty with the surrounding native tribes that were resisting U.S. occupation in many key areas of the Northwest. Throughout the 1790s and early 1800s, Hull would hold a variety of different state and local positions, including judge of the County Court of Appeals, state re representative and senator, and major general of the militia. Despite these many successes in his political and military career, Hull's greatest challenge would not come until President Thomas Jefferson appointed him governor of the newly formed Michigan Territory in 1805. A position largely given per, for political reasons, since Hull was a Democratic Republican, even though he was from a heavily Federalist-controlled area of the country. Scarcely a month after Hull had accepted his position, the settlement of Detroit would burn to the ground as a result of a bakery fire. Instead of being greeted by a growing and prosperous frontier town, Hull would see the ashes of what had been the site of his governorship. As a result, the first few years of his governorship would be focused on rebuilding the town and refortifying the outer defenses. In 1807, he negotiated the Treaty of Detroit, a territorial agreement with the surrounding natives which would hand over a significant southeastern portion of land to Michigan. At around the same time, Hull was made aware of the possibility of war after the famous Chesapeake Leopard incident and rushed to improve the defenses of the town. But the war would not break out until the 18th of June, 1812, although Hull would not be made aware of this fact until two weeks after the war had already been declared. At this time, Hull had been leading a combined militia force mostly composed of Kentucky and Ohio militiamen in an effort to uh, reinforce Detroit and surrounding forts before the outbreak of war. Had he been made aware earlier of the fact that war had been declared, which he should have been since he received a war dispatch on the day that war had been declared, Hull could have made haste with his army to Detroit and avoided being caught unprepared, but instead Hull would experience difficulties as a result of unreliable communications. Unknown to him that war had already been declared, Hull had employed an American merchant vessel to carry his army supplies up towards Detroit so that the army would not be so burdened. But this vessel would be seized by the British as a war prize, since they were made aware of the war a full week before Hull was. Despite this setback, Hull's militia would make it to Detroit and would prepare to launch an invasion of Canada, as he was ordered to do by the Madison administration. 
Personally, Hull believed that an invasion of Canada was near impossible without a proper American Navy in the Great Lakes, and believed his militia force was in a, inadequate to defend Michigan as it stood. Shortly before the outbreak of war, Hull wrote to Secretary of War William Eustace about his concerns if war with Britain was declared. However, his personal views were largely ignored, under the belief that the Americans could overwhelm the Canadians through their numbers and coordinated attacks. As we know, neither of these factors were a reality in the actual war, but Hull had to at least attempt to invade Canada and capture Fort Malden, which lay right across the river from Detroit. Hull's invasion was supposed to occur roughly at the same time as American armies would invade through Niagara and Montreal, but the other two armies experienced a series of delays, either through communication or with disorganization in ranks. So for most of July and part of August, Hull would be the only general fighting actively in the war, with all other armies still outside of the action. On July 12th, Hull and his militia force crossed into Canada and began to organize for an attack on Fort Malden and other small military posts, depending on the vulnerability of each at the time. But as J.C.A. Stagg reports in his book, The War of 1812, Conflict for a Continent, Hull's character was weak and his behavior often unpredictable. This would lead many in the militia to question the legitimacy of his authority. This was further confirmed when Hull decided to wait for more artillery guns instead of trying to seize Fort Malden while it was still vulnerable. This hesitation proved to be costly, as Hull would learn about the capture of the American Fort Mackinac and would largely be put on the defensive as a result fearing that the British and their Native American allies would cut their supply chains while they were still in Canada. Shortly afterward, Hull would pull part of his army out of Canada in an effort to ensure the protection of Detroit. By August 15th, Detroit was surrounded by the British and their Native American allies. When first presented with the terms of surrender by General Brock of the British Army, Hull refused. However, on August 16th, Brock threatened to allow the natives to kill and plunder as they pleased. This frightened Hull, who believed that women and children might be massacred as a result if the town had been taken. By early afternoon on that day, Hull had surrendered without firing a shot, believing that he was saving the citizens of Detroit from being massacred by the natives. The surrender of Detroit came as a shock to most Americans, who had believed that Canada would be easy to take. Blame for this failure was placed almost solely on Hull, largely as a result of his subordinate officer, Colonel Lewis Case, who would succeed Hull as territorial governor, governor of Michigan. Hull was court-martialed on charges of neglect of duty, cowardice, and treason in the winter of 1814 and 15. Hull was convicted of the first two charges and was sentenced to be shot. But in light of his Revolutionary War record, President James Madison had spared his life with a pardon. William Hull would spend the rest of his life with his family in Massachusetts, and would even recover some of his former reputation. But the failures of Detroit and Canada would haunt him for the rest of his life. Hull would pass away November 29, 1825.